five. How it can be that parents sometimes aren't allowed to know, in quotes, whether or not their child has been regendered at school, being called by another pronoun. Four. The Conservatives overall in relation to this issue have been what one might be described as cowardly. Three. If you do a straight comparison of the UK and the Eurozone over the last few years, we pretty much held our ground. And in many areas, we're doing better, including manufacturing. Two. I'm walking around the place and people say, good morning, Baroness, or hello, my lady. And I'm like, oh, my God. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with me, Liam Halligan, and ordinarily Alison Pearson. But the trusty co-pilot's taking a week off from steering the rocket of right thinking. And I'm delighted to welcome back a friend of the podcast to join me, she of Moral Maze and House of Lords fame, the founder and director of the cross-party think tank, the Academy of Ideas. It's Baroness Claire Fox. Hello. Great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us, Claire. Even now, Claire, with the House of Commons in recess, the UK's febrile pre-election news agenda waits for no one. The astonishing inquiry into the post office scandals ongoing with the UK postmaster hero-in-chief Alan Bates, he in the title of that fabulous ITV drama, Mr Bates vs the Post Office, giving testimony this week. Meanwhile, ahead of local elections in England on May the 2nd, Tory MPs are grappling with a question the mere posing of which many voters will find crazy, yet may come to pass. Not least if the Tories get a hammering early next month. And that question, should MPs dispose Rishi Sunak and install yet another Tory leader ahead of a general election expected in October? Talking of which, Tories are hoping against hope the economy will improve over the coming months ahead of that general election, generating some kind of feel-good factor that may convince at least some voters to give them another chance. But is the economy really improving? We talk not to me, what the hell do I know? We're joined on the rocket by that rare bird in public life, a card-carrying economist who's actually capable of independent and original thought. That's coming up soon. But first, Claire, thanks again for joining me on the rocket for Alison's week off. I'd love to hear, as will our listeners, your take on lots of things, on Labour, on the Tories, on what Nigel Farage, someone you and I know quite well, could and should do over the coming months. But first, I want to talk to you about a subject close to your heart. Today, Wednesday, as we record Planet Normal, we're expecting the publication of the long-awaited cash review into how the NHS should care for children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. Chaired by leading consultant paediatrician Hilary Cass, This report is expected to confirm a fundamental shift in the treatment offered to gender-questioning children. It's been three and a half years in the making, and Cass's interim findings, published in February 2022, have already provoked the closure of the controversial Gender Identity Development Service for Children and Adolescents, managed by the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust in London. How did we get here, Claire? And what's this final Cass report actually saying? So it's actually a very exciting day in relation to the discussion around gender in young people because there's been, let's put it this way, and as indeed Dr. Hilary Cass herself says, something of a toxic atmosphere in relation to the discussion about gender in young people, such that we've had a situation in which people who care for the young and who worked at the Tavistock were effectively encouraged to affirm any young person that turned up and said, I'm gender distressed, and to affirm them in such a way that they would only go down one route, which was the medicalization of a young person thinking that they're, in inverted commas, born in the wrong body. And that has led to what some are describing as the greatest medical scandal of all time. But certainly, Dr. Hilary Cass has made great play of pointing out that medical negligence of some sort has been involved in this because only one answer has been given to the young people saying that they feel distressed about their gender, and that is that they should take, for example, puberty blockers, sex-related hormone medication, and ultimately, of course, would lead them down the path of potentially castration or uh, double mastectomies, you know, actual physical intervention in that way. And I think that this, therefore, is an exciting day because even... Now, and we're recording this in the morning of the Wednesday, there's already been almost like a kind of magical 
thing has occurred, which is, is that the media have covered the story fairly. I mean, I've been listening to the BBC this morning, God forgive me, as they say, and they have broken what has almost been a vow of silence in allowing this discussion and this debate to get a fair hearing. And I think that's what's really significant about the cash report. Not only will it change the medical approach to young people, but it might actually allow a bit of breathing space for people to discuss this rationally and calmly. We hope so, at least. There's been, hasn't there, Claire, a huge gap between how the political and media class or some of the political and media class have looked at this story, this issue in general, and how the majority of the general public will look at it, often completely baffled about why politicians are hesitating about how it can be that parents sometimes aren't allowed to know, in quotes, whether or not their child has been regendered at school, being called by another pronoun. Have we managed to get to this point where that gap has emerged? Yeah, so I think that's an important question because we're in a situation where, and this is the challenge of our lifetimes in a way, notable that many young teenagers interpret their, maybe their distress about growing up, their puberty, you know, puberty is a a bugger at the best of times. And particularly for young women, you know, you can be very self-conscious about your body and, you know, all these things are happening and you don't want it to happen. And there's all sorts of pressures on you. And it's become fashionable for the young to interpret that as, I want to change my gender. I want to change my sex. I mean, you can't biologically change your sex, but if I'm a young woman experiencing that, maybe I can be a young boy. And whereas we can now see from what Dr. Hilary Cass is saying that many of the explanations for this might well be that there's young people who've got mental health challenges. Sometimes it's teenagers with ADHD or with autism, all sorts of different problems Sometimes straightforwardly, by the way, you know, dealing with their sexuality, you know, a young girl who really is a lesbian, but not sure. And maybe it's easy to say that she's a boy. And rather than adults in the room stopping and saying, well, let's just calm down and not just simply go along with it. We've got to a situation where those who work with the young, both in medicine and in education, have almost accepted straight away that the answer must be that you can change your gender. And I think that the point that you've made about this gap between a particular group of people and, you know, the rest of society is that in the elite classes, whether it's in medicine or in education or in groups of uh, professionals, they, I'm afraid, either have been bullied into submission because those people who've had reservations have been accused of transphobia or of bigotry if they don't immediately go along with it. But on the other hand, there's been some enthusiasm to just simply say, oh, the younger right, we're old fashioned, we're going to go along with this. We know that there are organisations like Mermaids, like Stonewall that have almost worked very hard at capturing major institutions. They are the pro-transgender ideology organisations that are best known. And they have effectively told major institutions, if you don't go along with this, we're going to label you as backward and bigoted. The problem we've got, Liam, is that we're now in a situation where even the government, and this government has been slow to act on this, even the government, and even more significantly, we're streeting from Labour has just put out a statement that's very reasonable because the Labour Party, I'm afraid, have been part of the problem. But they now are saying, we recognise what Hillary Cass has said, we're going to go along with it. But now that the government and the opposition are saying, let's pause, the difficulty we've got is that it doesn't mean that anyone's going to take any notice. So the government recently brought out guidelines for schools saying that you shouldn't be forced to socially transition young people. Teachers should not be compelled to use the opposite pronouns or change the name. And in fact, they should tell parents. And guess what? It was ignored a lot in a lot of cases, yeah? Yeah, a lot of schools are proudly boasted we're ignoring the guidelines. You say, Claire, some teachers have accepted that, you know, a kid may feel that they are born in the wrong body and they're a different gender rather than just being homosexual or going through a tomboy phase or going through a feminine phase if you're a lad. We are at that point, aren't we? Isn't it worse than that, though, in the sense that some teachers have actually become activists 
in this area, almost encouraging children to go down this route, cheered on by some of the organizations that you've spoken to. And there's a lot of financial interest in the background here, isn't there? This stuff is big money. You know, these drugs, these puberty blocking drugs, so-called top surgery as it's horrifically and colloquially labeled by some people who talk in this area. Yeah, there's no doubt that there's a bit of a racket going on and your point about financial incentives undoubtedly applies. But I think probably it's more ideological, which is that this issue has become one of the defining issues of being on the right side of history. It shows that you're progressive. We've seen that there's a number of issues in which having the right opinion gives you that sacred position of being a part of a new elite that can shape society. And I'm afraid that too many people who work in education, teachers, as you say, have become activists in this cause because a 13, 14 year old doesn't automatically know what's wrong with them when they're having a crisis of identity. But when you've got adults in the room who actually actively suggest that this might be the solution, it's like a form of grooming, as some people have said, where they're, you know, they're saying to young people, this is the answer. And I find it utterly despicable that adults have not just gone along with this, but created the basis on which instead of reassuring your people, treating them as, as Holy Cass has suggested, holistically, looking at all of the different issues that might be on the table, they've only gone down one route. Because it's like wearing a star saying, I am a good person, I am a virtuous person, I'm progressive because I agree with trans ideology. And we all know on a whole range of political issues that you discuss all the time on Planet Normal. One of the ways that this operates is that you kind of think of yourself as one of the enlightened, virtuous, selected people as against the mass of people, which usually includes parents who are considered to be unfit to rear their own children, don't know what they're doing. And teachers, sometimes health workers, people in all sorts of institutions have decided that they know best for how the young children of the country should be dealt with. And it's a way of distinguishing yourself from the hoi polloi and the masses and the mob by saying, I am on the right side of history on gender ideology. I am therefore against all those horrible backward people. It's a kind of anti-populist elitism that we're seeing, as with many other issues around this issue of gender ideology. Just talking about politics more broadly, Claire, we do face these local elections in England on the 2nd of May. The Tories are probably going to get a real hammering. It could lead to a leadership crisis in the party, yet another one. When it comes to this issue of gender dysphoria and the culture wars in general, Rishi Sunak's been reluctant to weigh in, hasn't he? Do you think he's been right to do that? And do you think this cash report will mark a turning point? I think that the Conservatives overall in relation to this issue have been what one might be described as cowardly. They undoubtedly have reservations about the whole issue of gender, but they just wanted the issue to go away. But that's the case with Keir Starmer as well. I've noted that it's maybe surprising that Labour Party have welcomed the CAS report. Yeah. But on the other hand, we also know that Annalisa Dodds has constantly, and she's a, you know, a shadow front bencher, has constantly said we're going to have a conversion therapy bill, which is, is part of the same discussion. She is still talking about that as we speak. And the inability for either side to really be firm on this, With I mean, to be fair, uh, Kemi Badenoch being one of the rare exceptions, I think is disappointing is the word that I would use. It smacks of people who don't understand how important such issues are, who have created the situation in the first place, because if it wasn't for the issues around gender recognition that the Conservatives brought in, let's remind ourselves, we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. But cowardice amongst politicians could be, and as we reach the, the local elections, I'm delighted about the cast review, but I'm not yet reassured that the political class is prepared to be brave on the issue, really. I'm hoping cast will be a turning point, but I keep thinking things can only get better and that they don't always. We've had some really good discussions here on Planet Normal about whether or not the Tories should try and change leader again before a general election. I think it's fair to say 
that our listenership is pretty split. Probably the majority of emails we've had have agreed that they should go for a new leader. But then I talk to a lot of people elsewhere in the political and media class, and they think that would be completely mad and it would just look like a Tory psychodrama. What do you think from your perch in the House of Lords these days? I think that the psychodrama is exactly my approach to this. I, I just think it's too late. The Conservative Party are struggling to not implode. And I can't see why a new leader would change anything substantially. I'm afraid that the last 14 years, and particularly the betrayal, as many people would understand it, of the 2019 demand by the voters for a political realignment, which was not realised either by Boris Johnson and was completely dispatched once he was usurped, and the subsequent, you know, bringing back of Jeremy Hunt and David Cameron and so on, it just feels all too little too late. So I can't see why a leadership election would resolve that other than to make some people feel a bit better in the Conservative Party. They might save one or two seats, but what a distraction. We're at that point where you just want the whole thing to be over. We know they're going to lose the election. Can we just kind of move on so we know what we've got to approach with a new government, which, by the way, I'm not relishing the prospect of, but I just feel as though we're just delaying the inevitable. And again, Claire, you're very much a sort of politically heterodox person. You're traditionally from the left. You stood for the Brexit party. And ahead of those elections, Claire, what's your take on where Labour are? Can Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves get away with just matching the Tory spending plans and trying to say as little as possible Or do you think they have to actually go out there and win, not just these local elections, but this general election too? I think that I won't be the first person, it's not an original thought, to note that although I think Labour will win the elections both locally and nationally, it's not based on a new enthusiasm for the Labour Party. I think that they themselves keep saying we won't be complacent. I think they're right about that. But they don't really have to say very much because of the collapse of the Conservatives. And it's almost like I can't imagine what the Labour Party would have to do in order to lose, not because it's got any talent whatsoever. When I talk to people who traditionally voted Labour, then broke with Labour, particularly around Brexit, but it could have been over the lockdowns or any any number of reasons why they despise the Labour Party in many ways, Identity politics is one that comes up all the time amongst people I talk to. Some of them are now going to vote Labour, but with some heavy heart, you know, there's not a real, oh, everything will be better. And so I just think that the Labour Party are almost, you know, strategically better to not do very much. You know what I mean? If they carry on being anodyne, it's not going to do them any harm. I don't think that they're going to be able to elicit an enthusiastic response for their programme because they haven't really got very much to offer. Their big new ideas were what? You know, a green economic revival by making net zero targets even more stringent. No disrespect, but that is not a popular cause amongst the masses of people. And they themselves realise it's far too expensive and have kind of rode back from it. But there isn't very much on anything. They just will be better off Stay storm and hope that people think they'll be more competent and less toxic than the Tories are at present. And while you're traditionally on the left of politics, Claire, you famously stood as a Brexit Party candidate. You got to know Nigel Farage very well. I obviously see a lot of Nigel here at GB News as well. He is really in an interesting position at the moment, isn't he? What do you think he will do? Do you think he'll end up leading reform? Do you think reform will do well? Do you think reform will swing either of these elections? So it's an interesting question. And it has to be said that I have not got a clue what Nigel will do. I think maybe because he's not quite sure himself. But anyway, he's become a hugely influential figure. And in some ways, the fact that he has not declared yet, he becomes even more important because the questioning of what he will do makes him have an influence in lots of ways. And his GB News show, by the way, is very well watched and people take notice of what he says on it and what his views are. And 
as far as I'm concerned, reform is slightly a different matter. Reform will undoubtedly be the beneficiaries of this disillusion with the Conservatives and the lack of enthusiasm for Labour. I suspect that a lot of people won't vote at all, but those who are dissidents who are really screaming out for an alternative to the, you know, the two-party system could well vote for reform and they're creeping up the polls. I don't think they're going to necessarily be able to return MPs. It's very difficult to know, actually, but it's a little bit like we just said about the Labour Party, which is reform don't have to do very much. A lot of people I talk to haven't really got a clue what reform's policies are, but they just represent almost, uh, you know, as a kind of metaphor, the fact that you want something different. I think there is, by the way, increasing frustration about the problems of representation. I don't want to get into whether we have PR or not, but there is a problem of a lack of representation when you've considered that a party might well get millions of votes and not have any MPs. I think that will cause something of a political storm. And reform could well be the basis on which we have a look at how we have first past the post or what have you. So they're highly influential, but not because of necessarily anything they say. And when I look at their programme, I'm not necessarily totally enthused by parts of it. Some of it I recognise and think is fine. I certainly cheer them on as for what they represent. I also would like to see the SDP, the slightly left-leaning alternative, have a bit more profile and, and, and publicity than they presently get because they are quite serious about politics. I just want things to be shaken up. And I can't stand the fact that we only really have a choice between the Tory party and the Labour party, which is not in any way inspiring at present. I agree with you very much, Claire, about the SDP. And I know Alison does as well. We recently had on the podcast as our guest, Amy Gallagher, who's the young South Londoner who's standing as the mayoral candidate for the SDP on the 2nd of May. We've also had William Clouston on the podcast, yeah. who is the leader of the SDP. Isn't Amy a breath of fresh air, Liam? Very, very impressive young woman who came to prominence, who became a politician you know, by accident because she was a regular NHS nurse who was outraged that she was made to go through some kind of racial awareness training that she felt was hugely insulting to her. So she's suing the NHS, and I know a lot of people are backing her in in that cause. I think reform will do pretty well. I don't think they're going to translate you know, their astonishing vote share in opinion polls you know, up a 10, 15% in some polls now, just a few points short of the Tories. I don't think that they're going to get necessarily translate that into vote share in the local or, or, or indeed the general election or into parliamentary seats. But, you know, UKIP didn't win any parliamentary seats, but they had enormous influence because they came second in lots of places and swung results, didn't they? Yeah. And so you don't necessarily have to win parliamentary seats to be influential, though I agree with you. If they do end up getting, you know, 10% of the vote and no seats, while the SNP get, you know, a couple of percent of the vote countrywide. Obviously, it's different because they're only in Scotland, but they get double-digit numbers of seats as they have in the past. It will lead to a reopening of that debate, I think, about proportional representation. Just finally, Claire, in this section, I know a lot of listeners will have been watching you in the House of Lords, standing up, making speeches. Sometimes I think it's fair to say their lordships are warm towards you. Sometimes there's some active hostility when you stand up. How are you finding it in the House of Lords? And do you still pinch yourself every time you stand up to speak there? Well, I think it's more often active hostility, but it's been slightly muted after over three years. I think that it was unusual for members of the House of Lords to hear people sometimes express a commitment to people outside of the House of Lords and to keep going on about democracy. And I'm well aware of the irony of being unelected myself, making those points. But the House of Lords is not an organisation that's used to considering the public's point of view. Yeah, I pinch myself all the time. You know, I can't believe it. And I can't <laughs> believe it when people say, you know, I, I'm walking around the place and people say, good morning, uh, Baroness, or hello, my lady. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And also the surroundings are, yeah, this is kind of pertinent in some ways, 
because there's been this big debate about whether the Foreign Office should be revamped and they should dump all their paintings because it implies that Britain uh, was great or tries to project some historic notion of Great Britain, you know, in terms of its imperial glory. Well, you know, you can't beat the House of Lords for that. And I have to say that I actually find the environment more inspiring than I thought from that point of view, because I do feel as though there's a sense of tradition there that reminds me regularly that actually I have to be committed to democracy. You know, this is parliament and the paintings of old and all of the statues and all of the beautiful surroundings gives a sense of awe, not necessarily to the elite, but it gives me a sense of awe of what was well and long fought for, which was a democratic parliament, a place in which ordinary people would be treated as equals at the voting lobbies. And even though we're unelected in the House of Lords, we're there to take very seriously lawmaking and legislation that gets passed in the Commons by the elected MPs and scrutinising it. And it drives me mad that the House of Lords has taken it upon itself recently to behave as though they're an unelected opposition that know better than everyone else. And so I regularly stand up and remind them that we don't and that we are unelected and we should watch ourselves and not overreach. Amen to that, Claire. Now on to our Planet Normal guest, who's climbing aboard the rocket this week? Well, what with the news on tax, national insurance, a possible interest rate cuts soon, and the Tories delaying a general election because they're hoping the cost of living crisis will ease over the coming months, I thought it was time to invite an economist onto Planet Normal, because having just one economist in the cockpit is never enough. Julian Jessup boasts a pocket background, Cambridge educated. He then spent time at the Treasury while holding other senior posts across Whitehall as an economist. But aside from the public sector, he also has a wealth of experience working in the city, advising real world firms and investors. On top of that, under the leadership of the economist and telegraph columnist Roger Bootle, Julian played a key role in the growth and development of the highly successful consultancy Capital Economics. It's this varied nature of his experience across both the public and private sector is one reason why he's widely respected for the coherence and independence of his views. Julian Jessup now combines a portfolio career advising companies and public bodies and giving expert testimony to parliamentary committees with a wealth of pro bono work at schools and universities. Julian Jessup, great to have you here on the Rocket of Right Thinking. Do you buy this idea that the UK economy is getting stronger so it makes sense for the Tories to delay a general election? There are plenty of signs that the economy has returned to growth in the first few months of this year. Certainly all the important business and consumer surveys are pointing in that direction. We've also started to get a few sort of hard numbers coming through. So you know, retail sales, for example, recovered from the flunk they had just before Christmas. So plenty of evidence that things are, are getting better. And it makes sense that they would. If you think about it, the main reasons why the economy slipped into a, a shallow recession at the end of last year were the headwinds from higher inflation and the lagged effect of higher interest rates. But we know inflation is now falling sharply. It'll probably be below the, the Bank of England's 2% target in the April data. And the markets, I think, are quite right to expect quite chunky interest rate cuts in the second half of the year. And I think that's the sort of key driver of the economic recovery. So the Tories, I think, will be wise to wait maybe until November to see the full benefits of that to come through. I think it's clear that borrowing costs are very likely to come down. We see that in borrowing costs set by the markets, if not yet in terms of the base borrowing cost set by the Bank of England. But it's not true that the tax burden's coming down, is it? I think it's fair to say that people was really starting to feel that additional taxation. Even though headline rates of national insurance are coming down, these ghastly frozen thresholds means that the amount of tax many of us are paying, including some pensioners, is going up. Yes, I think that's clearly going to be a headwind that's going to be with us for some time. Um, 
The only two things I could say about that, one is, though, to some extent, it's inevitable that the, the tax burden would rise after the way that the government responded to COVID, you know, shutting down the economy, injecting huge amounts of taxpayers' money to to keep it in work, to, to prevent businesses from failing. So there's that huge overhang of additional debt, and it's difficult to see how that could be dealt with without some sort of increase in the, in the tax burden, at least in the short term. And the second thing, and here I would give the government a little bit of credit, is that they have made an effort to rebalance the tax burden a little bit. So you mentioned the cuts in national insurance. So while the tax burden overall is going up, at least it's shifting away from a tax on employment income towards other taxes, often paid by people on higher earnings. So at least there's a bit of a rebalancing going on. But overall, this is definitely not the position that we, we want to be in. And you know, I, I share the concern of, of, of many others that we've got into this sort of doom loop now of you know, rising taxes, weaker growth, deterioration in the public finances, less money to spend on public services, and ironically, taxes having to go up even further. And I still think that's something that governments should do more to avoid. Let's take a more historic view for a moment. Why do you think it is that basically since the global financial crisis, since the late 2000s, the UK economy has never really got out of second gear, has it? Our trend rate of growth has been sort of barely 1% rather than the 2 2.5% that we watched as young economists in our in our 20s and 30s. It is pretty depressing. You know, we, we're getting excited now about the prospect of a return to growth as if something like 0.5% was something to be happy about. Since the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, there's been a marked uh, shift down in our productivity growth rate. As I say, it's more than 2% before the global financial crisis. Since then, it's averaged less than 0.5%. So pretty much the only reason we've recorded any decent growth at all over that period has been the, the rapid growth in the population, which is something that in the short term is a good thing, but in the long term creates all sorts of additional problems. So we do have a big problem. It's what economists often call the, the productivity puzzle, trying to explain why growth has slowed since then. I think there are a number of factors contributing that. A run of bad luck, a series of economic shocks. The global financial crisis was the first one of those that sort of set off the chain of events. But we've had others as well. I mean, I'm a, you know, I was a, a fan of Brexit, but there's no doubt that that has dampened investment in the economy and damaged trade with, with the rest of, uh, of Europe. There was the impact of COVID and then the energy crisis. So that a series of shocks have, have hit the economy. We're also, of course, not the only country that's seen a you know, pretty sharp slowdown in growth since 2008, 2009. Most of the rest of Europe and much of Asia has done so as well. But there is one economy that, that stood apart from this, which is the US. They still seem to be growing pretty rapidly. Some of that is just the, the, the sugar rush of all the additional government spending, partly related to sort of green investment. It's also because, you know, they've maintained a pretty flexible economy, whereas I think in many ways we've, we've headed in the wrong direction. I think you know, some people say that, you know, an even bigger role for the state is part of the solution to the productivity puzzle. I think it's actually part of the problem. And if you look at some of the areas where we've seen the sharpest slowdown in productivity growth, it has been areas like financial services and energy where we've seen some of the biggest increases in regulation and state control. And that's had knock-on effects on the rest of the economy. So, you know, the relatively high energy prices that we pay in the UK compared to the US in particular is undoubtedly a big headwind for growth and productivity as well. Just before I ask you about energy prices, we should also point out, shouldn't we, Julian, that the public sector has seen massive, not just failures of growth in productivity, economic efficiency, if you like, but actual quite serious reductions in economic efficiency across the state itself. That's a very important point. So although there is a, there is a productivity problem in the private sector, at least productivity has continued to grow. Whereas in large parts of the of the public sector, if anything, it's fallen. I'm particularly thinking of the NHS, health and social care more generally, also to some degree, education. So more money, but fewer operations in crude terms. Exactly. And particularly starkly in the NHS, we've had you know, a massive increase in the amount of money pumped into the NHS, an increased number of doctors and, and, and nurses. And yet they're now actually treating fewer people than they were in many cases before the pandemic. I've got some sympathy there. I mean, it is difficult to, to raise productivity in the services sector, particularly when you're talking about services you're delivering on a face-to-face, one-to-one basis. I mean, there's only so many operations that a surgeon can do in a day or whatever else it might be. But there are plenty of services in the in the private sector which have been able to increase productivity. 
particularly by you know, better management, better use of AI, IT, all those sorts of things, where the NHS and many other public services generally lag well behind. Let's just return to energy prices. Why is it that British households, British firms are paying pretty much more than any other major European economy for their electricity, Julian? We have quite a high share of renewables in our overall electricity mix, roughly 30 to 40 percent. And we're told that renewables are cheap. So why is our electricity so expensive? There are a couple of problems. Probably the biggest is that our energy prices are set on the the cost of the marginal unit, the the form of energy that is most expensive at the time. And of course, recently, that's been natural gas because of the the fallout from Russia's full-scale invasion of of Ukraine. So even where some form of energy might be be cheaper, we're still paying the the highest price in the market. The second problem is the way that the off-gem cap on domestic energy bills works, because that's sort of been Introduces quite a quite a big lag. So other countries are already seeing the benefit of the the sharp falls we've had recently in natural gas prices, but they won't kick in in the UK in domestic bills until April when the off-gem cap is lowered. So it's a combination of an odd way of, of setting the price of energy, but also sort of lags introduced into the system by the operation of the energy cap set by off-gem. You mentioned that a lot of other Western economies are suffering, except for the US, which, of course, is the world's reserve currency. It can print the currency that everyone else in the world wants, which has its benefits, of course. But look at the eurozone. Look at the German economy, which has been in and out of recession for the last two or three years. Why do you think it is that we're so often told that all the UK's economic woes are because of Brexit? You back Brexit. You've been good enough to mention where you think Brexit has hindered the economy for now, but you've also been brave enough to point out where you think Brexit has helped the economy. And yet every good thing that happens in the UK economy seems to be, according to many broadcasters, despite Brexit. It is very frustrating. If you look at the rest of Europe, actually very few economies are doing well, particularly the economy is at the core of Europe. You you mentioned Germany. Now, you know, some people might say Germany is a special case because it it had an industrial model that is now clearly broken. So basically, it relied on importing cheap energy from Russia to make things to, to sell to China. So it's been squeezed at, at both ends there. So we can argue that Germany is an exception, except that the, the rest of Europe is struggling too. So France, the economic recovery there seems to have been stalled. Countries like you know Italy and Spain are, are doing a little bit better, but they benefited more than most from partly the, the rebound in tourism following the, the end of the, the COVID pandemic. Spain and actually Portugal have benefited from enormous amounts of intervention to keep energy prices down that you know, only a small country could get away with. Italy has thrown loads of money in its property market. So if you look beyond the headlines, actually, the, the rest of Europe is is looking pretty vulnerable. Lots of countries have also, of course, seen very big increases in their in the debt that they've taken on, including Italy and, and France during the last few years. So if you do a straight comparison of the UK and the Eurozone over the last few years, we pretty much held our ground. And in, in many areas, we're doing better, including manufacturing and financial services. So you know, two sectors that are supposed to be hammered by Brexit are actually doing relatively well. How do you think history will judge Liz Trust, Julian? Obviously, she gets a really bad press from many quarters, but others say that her, her ideas were right, even if the execution was badly handled. Well, as we know, unfortunately, history is often written by the victors and it's relatively easy for lots of people to say, I told you so. But it has got ridiculous. I've seen people claiming, for example, that you know, the, the current level of mortgage interest rates is, is the responsibility of Liz Truss's mini budget. Which, that was in September 2022. People suggest that Liz Truss crashed the economy, which she, she clearly didn't. Now, obviously, she made mistakes in the, the presentation of her policies and the timing. And maybe she didn't listen as closely to some of her advisors as she, she should have done. But it's interesting how far actually she shifted the debate, I think, in the right direction. So Everybody is now talking about the importance of, of, of economic growth. So, you know, Labour are putting it at the sort of forefront of their of their manifesto. She was very sceptical about the the fiscal framework, and I think you know, lo- lots of people, whatever their political position, do think our current set of fiscal rules are bonkers and, and, and counterproductive. She was right to flag up the dangers of having interest rates that were too low for for too long. So, it's sort of ironic that she's been blamed since then for interest rates returning back to more normal and, and healthy levels. I think she was right on a, on, a, on a lot of things. 
The other thing that worked against her, of course, was that, frankly, just bad luck. I mean, she was doing things at a time when, you know, energy prices were soaring, when interest rates were rising around the world, including in the US, as a result of central banks returning interest rates towards more normal levels. So the so the, the timing was bad. That's something she should have adjusted for. But I think if you know, she'd become prime minister a few months later, even if she'd done the same thing with a few tweaks, I still think she'd be prime minister now. Interesting. It's worth saying, I'm just looking at the 10-year gilt yield. Uh, what's that? That's, of course, the amount of money the government has to spend to borrow from financial markets, from investors for 10 years. And the 10-year gilt yield, to your point, Julian, during most of 2023 was actually quite a long way above what it was at the height of the, quotes panic uh, at the time of Liz Truss's mini budget, which, of course, was months and months and months after she'd actually been in office and most of her policies had been reversed. Some economists talk in whispers about the role of the Bank of England during that mini budget, Julian. The fact in particular that the historic record shows that just a few days before that mini budget, the Bank of England actually started selling bonds into the market, selling government debt into the market, even though it knew that Liz Truss's mini budget would involve the announcement of more debt sales to come. Do you think in retrospect, Go back to that the Bank of England intervention, which could have happened at any time, primarily no reason caused by for them to interest start rates two being too low mini budget. And the, and the, do you think that now looks mistimed? Yes, I do. I think but, I mean, the number of big mistakes that the Bank of England has made over, over the last few years. The Bank of England misjudged inflation, it misjudged the impact of, of COVID on the economy. It saw it primarily as a, a shock to demand, whereas really it was, a, it was a shock to supply. So pumping more money into an economy that was supply constrained was bound to lead to the surge in inflation. So they, they misjudged that. They were then you know, too slow to to respond on the upside. And now I think they're leaving interest rates too high for too long. But as you suggest, it's not just about interest rates. And equally important is, is what they're doing with their purchases and sales of government bonds, what's sometimes known as quantitative easing, which has now become quantitative tightening. And the Bank of England is actually pretty much the world's only major central bank that it, it is aggressively selling bonds back into the market. So it's tightened monetary policy, not just by raising interest rates, but you know, by increasing the supply of bonds and therefore tending to push down their price and, and raise long-term borrowing costs. The timing of what they did in the run-up to the to the mini budget was clearly very damaging. It made things look worse than they needed to be. These are real human beings involved. I mean, they must have known what they were doing. I don't, but I, I tend to go for the cock-up theory of history rather than the conspiracy theory. And I think they just took the very pedantic view that, you know, we've not been told what's in the budget, so we're going to pretend it's not happening. And in the absence of any form of budget, what would we then do? And they decided that the, the right thing to do then was to you know, continue raising interest rates and to tighten policy by selling back bonds. Now, I think a bit more you know, flexible judgment by the Monetary Policy Committee would have said, actually, let's wait and see what's in the budget and everything else that's going on. The other way in which the bank feeling was involved in the problems at the time in an unhelpful way, of course, was the the so-called liability-driven investment crisis, the, the problems that hit pension funds. And that exacerbated the, the fallout from the rise in market expectations for interest rates are heading. And we, we can argue about exactly who is responsible for that crisis. But at the end of the day, you know, the Bank of England is responsible for financial stability as well as monetary policy. And it seemed to have completely missed this potential time bomb in the pensions market. Julian, how concerned are you about a Labour government. Rachel Reeves is obviously a serious person. A lot of people would say she's a sensible person. How do you think Labour will actually act in office when it comes in particular to tax and spend? And how do you think financial markets may respond? Well, starting with how financial markets are going to respond, I think they, they're going to be quite relaxed about this. I mean, I, I, I talk to people in the in the city all the time and what investors really want is sort of certainty and, and, and stability. I think some people would see a change of government as a positive simply because things will be more stable for a while. And the fact that Rachel Reeves has, has recommitted actually to a lot of things that the Tories had stuck with for a while anyway, particularly the fiscal rules, which will be tying her hands quite a lot on some of the crazier things that she might want to do. I, I think you know, the markets probably will, will take it reasonably well. I do still have some big concerns, though. A couple of things in particular I focus on. First of all, I think it's it's inevitable that the taxes will have to rise even further under Labour than they might have done under the under the Conservatives. I don't think Labour's got an enormous amount of appetite for rolling back the state. So that has to be paid for somehow. And 
So taxes will go up and they'll, they'll probably focus on things that they would regard as just targeting relatively well-off people, wealthy people and so on. But, it, but in practice, that will ripple through the economy. The second thing that concerns me is their close links to to the unions. I think there'll be lots of unhelpful things done in the labour market, you know, even bigger increases in the minimum wage, things that labour would describe as improvements in workers' rights, but which could actually backfire in terms of reducing employment opportunities. Targeting zero hours contracts is a good example of that, but there are, there are others as well. So uh, I think in overall macroeconomic terms, won't necessarily make a huge difference. Markets will really be pleased that there's a bit more certainty. But I think there are lots of little things that will do on tax and on the labour market in particular that I think will undermine growth and probably means that you know unemployment is higher than it would otherwise have been as well. Julian, always brilliant to talk to you. Thank you so much for your economic insights. Thanks so much for joining us on Planet Normal. That's great. Thank you. Well, there you go, Claire. Julian Jessup, an economist, I'm sure, whose work you've followed over the years. What's your general feel about where the economy is? You know your bones, how important it is in terms of driving political outcomes. Do you feel that there is an improvement in the air? I think it's precisely because people don't feel there's an improvement that it's very difficult for the Conservative government to take advantage of any technical improvements when people really are quite frightened at the moment about the fact that things seem to be getting worse. And I think one of the reasons for that is there's no sense of dynamism around the economy. You know, you don't feel as though there's any real push towards economic growth. Everybody uses the growth word. I thought it was fascinating. That point about Liz Truss might have been unpopular for saying growth was important, but now everybody's at it. And I noticed the Labour Party even using a phrase she used, which is you can't just divide up a a small cake, you've got to build a bigger cake, uh, which is what she said. But the sense in which if the state were going to be involved in the economy, you'd want them, from my point of view, to be involved in, for example, a mass national campaign of house building or infrastructure or, you know, if, if the state was investing in those AI solutions, uh, new technology, that would tackle productivity. But instead, you just get this sense of inertia. And it's precisely because of this kind of stagnation of productivity, I think. It's not just all about trade. It's not just about taxes. Well, you don't feel as though anything new is happening, whereas old industries are closing. You know, steel goes, and that seems like, oh, God, we've lost our steel works. What on earth happened there? And I do think that one of the greatest crises that we have has been around the nonsense, and I mean nonsense, in relation to organising the whole of the economy around cutting back on carbon. You know, you end up with the net zero targets and a general commitment to environmentalism that has just led to regulatory hell. And that seems to me to be stopping any innovation or the possibility of a real sense of new industries springing up left, right, and center. There's none of that, is there? It's interesting because until quite recently, the conventional wisdom or certainly the consensus view you'd hear across most of the media was that, oh, all this green investment is going to create lots of jobs, far from being an economic disadvantage, an economic burden, the whole sort of 2050 agenda, net zero agenda, would actually boost the economy. You don't hear much about that anymore. I do think that debate has started to shift. I do think high energy prices have led to a real reassessment among the silent majority, if you like, that yes, of course, we want a better environment. We want to leave the world in a better place for our kids and our grandkids. But we have to talk about how the costs of that adjustment are distributed. Who pays? We've got to make sure that the shift away from fossil fuels happens at a pace that's bearable, logical, and which doesn't bankrupt a big chunk of the country. I still think that fossil fuels are essential for any economic revival that's going to happen in any country in the world. And it's not a question of being glib about the environment or you know, not having any understanding of the potential impact of man-made climate change and so on and so forth. But I believe in mitigation, and I think you can't possibly 
deal with any problems that the climate might throw up if you've got a weak economy. And we can see that from where natural weather occurrences can have a decimating and devastating impact on very poor countries, whereas they can are survivable when you're a wealthy economic powerhouse. And so it seems to me that the only options we have are to plough on. Well, we are not ploughing on, we're kind of trudging on. I also thought, by the way, I know I'm, I talk about Brexit a lot, but if I could just mention, I thought that it was absolutely right, this point that was made about blaming Brexit for everything. I just was reflecting the other evening because we had a speaker for the, the Academy of Ideas Economy Forum and we had Catherine McBride on and she was making a, a very good point, I thought, which was there was always a danger when we were in the EU that, you know, politicians always blamed Brussels for everything, right? And even though I was Eurosceptic, that annoyed me because it was like they were kind of outsourcing blame somewhere else. Oh, we don't want to do it. They made us do it. But that's been seamlessly replaced by no matter what happens in the economy, people blaming Brexit or Liz Truss, that's the other one. But, you know, Brexit's to blame. Whereas actually what's really tragic is that Brexit gave opportunities for the UK economy to look at things and do things differently. Sadly, homegrown politicians have introduced the kind of regulatory regime, the kind of holdback on productivity that we saw coming from Brussels, but now are homegrown politicians doing the same thing or not removing the barriers to growth that they should be able to do now that we're not held you know, to account by what's happening in the European Union. Finally, Claire, briefly, do you think Labour will try and reverse Brexit? I don't think they'll reverse Brexit, but they'll carry on the trajectory that we've seen of late, which is closer realignment and the inevitable kind of in the orbit of the EU. That seems to me to be where they're going, which is depressingly, again, squanders the opportunities that that sovereignty affords us. I think that they have at least realised that a, an absolute reversal would be politically catastrophic. But no, I don't trust them with Brexit's inheritance, I'm afraid. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts, the citizens of Planet Normal. This is one of my favourite letters because it's on a subject that I'm obsessed with, which is from Gerald on last week's discussion on Scotland's new hate law. And Gerald says, Each year, Rangers play Celtic at Ibrox in front of 48,000 largely Rangers fans to be followed some weeks later by the return at Parkhead in front of 60,000 largely Celtic fans. One can imagine the number of alleged hate crimes will be off the scale, not to mention those committed in the pubs and clubs where the games will be shown. To arrest thousands of fans mouthing sectarian abuse is impractical, thus demonstrating the utter pointless nature of this silly virtue signalling law. My fear, however, Gerald, is that they will start arresting people for that, which I dread. But anyway, and this is from D, who says, I have a friend brought up in East Germany during the Cold War. You just can't understand what it's like to have to constantly say nothing because anything can be used against you and your family, my friend says. Well, Scotland will find out quite soon It's the soul-destroying silence needed in every part of one's life that is so depressing. Indeed, Scottish Stardy are back. This is from Farmer Giles in Kent. Yeah, he really is called Farmer Giles. Dear Planet Normal, more perceptive commentators on the net zero policy have remarked on the massive costs of upgrading the UK power network to cope with the extra strains that renewables place on it. In common with many utilities, underinvestment has left the system creaking even before adding fluctuating renewable output and increased demand for electric vehicles. As a business, we're experiencing how this money is being found, which if the same process was applied to domestic household customers, would cause riots. Like everyone, we've felt the huge increases in unit rates, but additionally, we've seen a 300% rise in daily standing charges from UKPN, that's UK Power Networks, the monopoly responsible for infrastructure on our high-use, half-hourly meters supplying our fruit cold stores. No negotiation or choice, just imposition via the power company's monthly bills. Yet again, the UK government goes to the business world to finance a problem. The recent lopsided cuts in national insurance to try and save their skins at the ballot box, while not touching employers' national insurance contributions, 
are another example, says Farmer Giles. As a UK food producer, we often wonder who the UK government thinks it's working for. Nothing gets done to reduce costs, massive taxes, dodgy trade deals, tacit acceptance of the UK's retail sector, screwing producers into the ground. Nothing's learned from recent events in the energy sector, and our food self-sufficiency keeps dropping. Thanks a lot for Planet Normal. Farmer Giles. We have an interesting letter here from Phil. He says, Dear Alison and Liam, I've followed Planet Normal for four years that, that has been broadcast, and you both have been very diligent in discussing some of the key issues that beset our nation. I think the sterling work you performed during the COVID period probably raised people's suspicions about the conduct of our establishment during those years and subsequently. As someone now in his late 70s, two things really keep me awake at night. The total insanity of everything related to the Climate Change Act and Net Zero. And I know that you've begun to air this issue and I'd encourage you to continue. It is the biggest economic suicide note ever dreamed of and must be stopped. I hope more people watch Martin Durkin's recent film and at least discuss it. And if I can just say to Phil and note, um, I was listeners in the film right at the end, um, but it is well worth watching. Uh, back to Phil, who says, the second nighttime fear I have is that of the state of the UK's defence sector. I was glad to hear in a recent episode that Alison had some recent discussions with military or ex-military personnel. Having spent my whole career in defence, both in the private sector and with NATO, I can tell you that the position in the UK is now desperate, almost irretrievable. An open debate would quickly reveal that we are, for all intents and purposes, defenceless. None of the three services has any real serious capability anymore, and it's getting worse. I'm not sure we could defend ourselves against a second-tier nation, let alone Russia or China. Anyone who tells you otherwise, including the latest hapless Defence Secretary, is either lying or doesn't understand. Please press on with your plans to feature a discussion on UK defence. Sincerely, Phil. Last week, we read out the satirical poem, The Doctor Won't See You Now, penned by Planet Normal listener using the non de plume Hans Dichter. This week, the Battle of Planet Normal Poets continues, and Bob the Bard, a giant among our growing band of verse-writing listeners, has struck back. Dear Planet Normal, writes Bob, I was very concerned about the amount of blasphemy against our national religion in last week's episode. I therefore think you should make amends by reciting a short prayer for our NHS. Thanks again for Planet Normal, which I think we should start calling Our Planet Normal. Regards, Bob. Here it is, a prayer for our NHS. Our NHS, which art infallible, sacred be thy name. Give us this day a GP appointment, or possibly in a few weeks, if it's not too much trouble. Forgive those who cause a scandal, and punish those who use the wrong pronouns. Deliver to us less while we pay thee more, for thou art the envy of every kingdom on earth, and those who disagree are evil. So let us all clap as we continue to wait forever and ever. Amen. My goodness, uh, Planet Normal is becoming the home of culture. And so I finish with another <laughs> cultural issue, which is, this is from Andy on the rebranding of the Union Jack on Team GB's Olympic kit which, by the way, when it comes to culture, art and design, I think, sat with designer. But anyway, Andy says, The union flag is not a brand. It's the unifying flag of a nation state, which we all have a human right to. Like the recent debacle with the FA and Nike over the cross of St. George, this design isn't the British English flag. Therefore, the FA and Team GB are not representing the UK and should not be entitled to any taxpayer funding. If they want to look about with a national flag, they can do it with their own money. Seeing as so many Olympians went to private schools, they shouldn't be short of a bob or two. On that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our Sanctuary of Sweet Reason, our flying refuge of Reason Views, email of the week, Claire. I want to go for uh, Gerald, uh, who raised the issue of Celtic and Rangers and the challenges that's going to pose for Police Scotland. So there you go, Gerald. Send us an email to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk and put in the subject heading of that email, mug winner. Give us your postal address and we will send you a Planet Normal mug. What a pleasure to be on replacing Alison. But of course, I can never replace Alison. 
which is why I listened diligently to her. I hope I just haven't embarrassed her by my presence here today, but it's been a great privilege being with you. You're always welcome, Claire. And as we speed away from our beloved planet normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Cass Ho and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>